case. <laughs> uh, but I wanted to to, to put it uh, uh, in that in that content uh, something there. Okay. Just click on got it. Yeah. 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 Thanks. Yeah. So we wanted to connect a little bit to that uh, um, because birds um, are very important in the place where we are going to talk about today. That is the Sierra Nevada de Santa Marta for the indigenous populations and also for pre Hispanic uh, populations. Uh, so, if you want to know more, there you can go to the QRs about the two projects, which are like brother and sister projects uh, in this case. And this is a list of the people that are involved. Also, here in the Faculty of Archaeology, there are people involved uh, in the X as well. Uh, so, what we have now uh, about the use the lighter in, in tropical environments, of so neotropical environments, that's with the things that we found in South America. First, it has been very successful approach to find archaeological or orthogonal features, basically the ones that have very, very sharp edges or like squares or, thing, or, or, or rectangles, things like that, or lines, and especially in relatively flat landscapes. So one very, very well known uh, uh, sites or no approach about this is what people have been doing now in the uh, Janus de Mojos in Bolivia. That's part of the uh, Amazon basin. And uh, they are implementing LIDAR there and they are founding this like new uh, low density urbanism in the Amazon forest, which was something that they were expecting in the 70s and the 80s. But it was uh, nice to be able to record it very well. And that's now happening thanks to the LIDAR uh, technology. We knew that there were sites there. We knew that they were uh, connected, but they were not a very good way to record this connection at the core actually the site. So the LIDAR is providing this opportunity. And this is a photo of, of, of actually the kind of landscape where they are working. So you have forest, where you have a little bit of savannas, wetlands. So there is working really great. It's, it's actually pretty nice. And the limitation is just more like this is a really, really big area. Uh, but it's really nice what we they are finding. Like this is from Tony Drew, but I just came from Colombia from, from a congress about Amazon archaeology. And they are finding more and more interesting uh, partners with, with this technique. So it's very nice. Um, there is another approach that is also very useful and has provide more information, but it's actually not quite yet where we want it to be as archaeologists. So it is implemented in forest areas with mountainous landscapes in Colombia, and it has been uh, useful to identify some earthworks or the structures, but they are much more irregular or they look more like the the landscapes itself, how the landscapes form in these areas. And it, it's an indication of where they can be, but not at the level of what we have in the Jan of the Mox, where you can see the shapes and the different roads and the paths that they have. So we would like to get to that point, but the conditions in these areas are very difficult. Well, first, the geometry of the archaeological sites, it's difficult to identify. So, so it's not the rectangular thing that we like so much in archaeology or as humans to make tables and things like that. So they took a different approach and, and they blend much more with the landscape. So that makes it harder to find them and harder to identify them uh, from the background. And the other part is just the conditions that you have in the area. So it's, it's like this, like, Mountains where you have to walk two hours to get to the site where you want to work. Uh, you are very limited about for the rain that occurs, like mostly half of the day, it's, it's raining, like raining a lot. <laughs> uh, so if you want to use any kind of new technologies that run with batteries, it's not really very nice to do it there. Uh, and also, well, the topography, it's, it's quite hard. Um, and you have the, the coverage or the canopy that is like very dense forest. Very beautiful area, but very hard to work with. Uh, but there are some colleagues that have been working and trying to do this. And they have this result that are actually quite good. They, they actually are identifying anthropogenic 
possible anthropogenic areas, so human activity areas that they think that they could be having more size, but not uh, defining precisely the structures that they have. There. So it's very useful, very good work, but we want to go a little bit in step forward there. And that's kind of the things that we're trying to explore. And also, other, other point that is very important in this case, it is that the service that they're using or the lighter service that they're using are very expensive. So the scanners and the configuration to use these scanners usually needs an helicopter and the scanners that is itself, they are very costly. And, and this is not sustainable for a lot of people, especially for researchers and the stakeholders in South America. Mm. So we can, for example, for the Ciudad Perdido, the area that we are working, or I'm going to talk about that later, Nagio uh, provided funding to document an area, and also in the Amazon, like the National uh, Institute of the Space Agency, I think it was, they paid for uh, documentation of, of certain parts of the Amazon, not for archaeological purposes, but that was the kind of, of, of resources that would really needed to be used to do this, this kind of studies. And also the other projects that are running there are usually projects run from Europe or the United States. So they need a lot of money. So researchers there are like a little bit uh, in the gap of how much they can use these technologies. Uh, and that's also a problem, I think. And another problem in Colombia, there are some more problems, is that most of the archaeological sites are below the surface. So we are actually quite uh, lucky, I guess, uh, in the cases that I'm going to present, because we do have some surface structures. Uh, but most of the archaeological sites, also in this area, are below the surface, so are really hard to identify with LiDAR. Because the LiDAR is giving us like what you have below the canopy, the terrain, the structure of the terrain, but usually it's really hard to get below the terrain. So we have to think a little bit about more about how we can approach this problem uh, by the LiDAR and maybe other technologies. Um, oh, so just these photos. Uh, this is Ciudad Perdida of the Juna. You will see more about this later because it's the area that I'm working right now. And these are kind of the sites that you find in Colombia. So I, I like this picture because they are going to start an excavation here. They prepare it, but usually you will like the you will see the archaeological site like this, just grass and cover like this. Uh, in the Netherlands, it's also very common to have that <laughs> problem. Uh, and you also have but when you start digging, you find this incredible archaeological record there that is still there and can be, can be protected and, and studied. Uh, so it's not all bad. So the objectives about the project uh, were quite in general. So the first one was trying to assess the cost-efficient LiDAR data collection uh, to monitor and look at archaeological sites. Uh, so basically trying to think how we can make use of light are less costly and most important how we can transfer this knowledge to stakeholders in Colombia uh, that want to use this. What we want to do in this case is more collaborate and I will talk a little bit more about that later with institutions there, try different trial and error like pay for these trial and error te techniques and give that information about trial and error, what works, what do, doesn't work to them and then they can have uh, a data-driven decision in, for example, things like which kind of equipment they should buy or what exactly, how, much, how many days I had to spend, uh, how much money do I have to spend to do this survey in this area that I'm interested for. So it's not thinking about like, I'm gonna give them all the information about how that works and how you can do it because they are much, much, uh, capable of doing it, and actually they are much more experienced in actually collecting the data in this area. But it's the opportunity of working together and get uh, experience of working together and know how to take the decision later on how to do things in their own way. And I think we've accomplished that uh, very well. 
all the part that we are doing is testing another, another automated methods for arteriolic acid detection. So far, we have some using some algorithms uh, to analyze LiDAR data, but we want to use that and in the LiDAR legacy data that is already there that some archaeologists have been analyzing. But we, we want to try another approaches to see if we can maybe find another patterns with more uh, precision uh, uh, than has been doing before. Uh, also, one of the things that we want to do is try to explore deep learning and combine the information in LiDAR, the very detailed information in LiDAR, with very detailed information in satellite imagery. So the, the idea is that we are not picking one or another source of data or technique, but rather thinking about how we can use the information that we get from LiDAR to inform us how to interpret much efficient kind of data that is, in this case, the satellite imagery or the multispectral satellite imagery that you can find uh, uh, with satellites for much more larger areas. So that's another thing that I will explore or present a little bit more later in the presentation. And other thing, it's trying to test a hypothesis of, of how people in the past related to the ecology or other species in the area. And that's a little bit more focus in the part of, of in my investigation or my, my research interest uh, in a theoretical level, I would say. It is like, and it's also drawn to some recent research in South America that found that most of the uh, forests that we have there, they were probably you made through the activities of humans from several years in the past. So basically saying that hyper-dominant species of the forest that, for example, you see in the Amazon, they are correlating very well in the space with archaeological sites, which suggests that humans have been involved in shaping this landscape that we thought it was like primary forest, but actually it's like something that it, it looks more like intervene by humans for a long, long time. So that's a good correlation, but I would like to explore much further than that, like what exactly is the relationship between it? Like what is happening in social terms with that uh, construction? Is all the sites are related with, with the trees or, or, or why they were using certain trees, certain near their houses, and what other trees are not uh, near them. And, and also going a little bit uh, further than that, thinking about only food, uh, for for trees, but also thinking about them as a source of raw materials for technologies, which is my my interest. Uh, so I'm trying to do something like that, and it's in, in, in one of the last ones because it's it's an ongoing process, and it, and we are just building data to get to answer this question. And at the end, also another another important uh, topic is trying to to do all these other steps to try to cover or, or define the, the pre-Columbia Saturn patterns, configurations in the area, which will enable us to or do another kind of analysis that are more social about how society were working or, or organizing in that time. And for, for where we want to do this, the first part will be here, something that we call the Sierra Nevada de Santa Marta. It's a huge mountain range. <laughs> Uh, here, basically one mountain, and and just for your purpose, uh, this is on the scale uh, the Netherlands against the area of the North part of Colombia. So it's quite about like one third of the Netherlands, maybe two. Of, yeah, full half of the Netherlands is pretty big area. Um, so methods and sensors. So. The first thing that we are doing now is collecting new later data with drones, which is in more efficiently uh, or cost efficiently than uh, being able to acquire the services of the more expensive configuration with the LiDAR and helicopters. And we are going to, or we, what we are trying to do is how far we can go with this technology, because we are not saying that the configuration with the drone, it's better. Uh, the helicopter and the other sensors that they were using are really good. They produce really good good data, but you probably need to some some more money 
to, to run them all the time. So we were so thinking like how far we can go with this like more efficient, uh, cost-efficient configuration and how, what kind of questions we can answer uh, with that, what kind of information we can get. Uh, we are also working with, uh, with the part of the new algorithm with legacy data that was already collected in the area, which actually collected by these methods uh, that are a little bit more expensive. Uh, specifically here around the, the site that is called Lost City or the Duna, or the Duna, uh, I like that better than Lost City, which was a very detailed LiDAR data set that they collected with NatGeo, and it's covering around 5.6 or 6 square kilometers uh, with data. And the new data that we are collecting, it's in this region where one of our colleagues has been collect conducting a survey for say, seven, eight years, uh, the desert survey. Mm, so we have areas where we have true positive for archaeological sites and features that are under the canopy, but also areas where we know that there are no archaeological sites. So that's very useful for, for us. Uh, and that helps us also to collect and, and assess how good is the LiDAR data, uh, uh, collecting LiDAR data with drones or with other sensors in this area where we do know that there are some archaeological sites, but there could be more archaeological sites there. Uh, also for the other method, all the other ideas that the correlation between archaeological sites and one specific uh, plant, that is a palm here, uh, this one here, that it has been from the 80s uh, proposed that they seem to correlate in space with the archaeological sites in this region. So, um, for that, we will be using satellite imagery, and I will present how we are doing that and see what first, if actually there's a correlation between, uh, and if there is a correlation, which, which kind of sites is correlating this kind of plan and why. Uh, just like a spoiler alert, this plan is very useful. So you can use it for building houses, uh, for making roads, for food. Uh, so it's quite useful, so it makes sense. Uh, to have it close to you in a way. So it makes sense that it's close to the archaeological sites. And they are still using it uh, now, like indigenous population there, uh, for mainly for building the roofs of their houses. Also, another part of the project is, is ground routing. So going through all this information, and then when we have the places where we think there are archaeological sites, or or where we think it could be archaeological sites, just go to the field and, and do the ground truthing. And that's kind of, of, of the whole uh, method that we have in this project. So the first part, the new LiDAR data, that's what we collected now in, the, in September, yeah, uh, in the Rio Frio area. That, is, that was the red part down in the in spur. And we collected that with a yellow scan mapper, which is a very portable, a small LiDAR. Uh, that is owned by TU Delft. Uh, we collected also data with another more uh, portable, yes, smaller, and maybe a little bit less powerful computing power, uh, like, like their configuration that the DGY is it's Muse, another kind of digital, and we use a drone in that for, for survey purposes uh, and went there. The big question with the new letter. Did this with this data from LiDAR was like the first one was like, could we penetrate this kind of canopy? So, this kind of things is what you see there, like you just see trees. It's, it is very dense. Like when we were seeing the data uh, from the imager, it's like, we don't know. Uh, was a big question. Like, will be penetrate because it's compared to the other sensors that are more powerful, it's like half of the power, basically. Uh, the, last, the laser that they use. So the other ones have struggled uh, trying to penetrate the area. So how we can make something that is half the power of the other one uh, penetrate this canopy? That was one question. The other question is how easy it was going to be to collect the data. Because like I said before, it's always rainy. When you see these clouds, you cannot fly the drone. They can take the drone. So you see them statically here, but they are quite fast. So they can throw your... <laughs> you run away, and, uh, and that's like very expensive uh, uh, problem. And of course, when it's raining, it's, it's not possible to use. Uh, also, the conditions are very hard, so the 
testing the limits of the technology there was like quite another question. It's like we could get easily through there 38, 40 degrees in the, in the, in the day. And actually we, we burn one uh, antenna, GNSS antenna, the, the heat just, yeah, yeah, broke the, the whole thing. So, uh, but, so that was the question. And also well, like we use some other technologies like the, this, this mule that was the most important part of the whole uh, field work because that was the, the one that allowed us to bring the equipment uh, to the places uh, where we are working. And other things like power generator because there is no there's no light there. So all these things were putting together for like this data. Uh, for the part of legacy data, later data, or uh, realizing that that was like a little bit easier. And, and this is just like a uh, short introduction of what kind of sensor they use. They use a more power core sensor that is long range, so you can cover more area, but you need an helicopter for that. So this uh, helicopter that they use, that you use to, to document the area, and it was an area that we know there are critical sites there, but the idea is to try to find more sites there. Um, And for sadly imagery, what we are trying to do, and this is one of the images that we are using, is, is trying to use it for the detection of the forest or the palms that they are there. So we got data from the play these new instruments. Is it's a really good data, it's really high resolution, so 30 centimeters pixel in the pan chromatic. And and you also have some, some multi-spectral bands that is also good. Uh, but there was usually a little bit less, but we, if we are talking about third centimeters, you actually can see differences in the forest there. So, so this, is our, this is actually the same site. There's one, this terrace, if I'm not mistaken, is this one, the big one. And, and this is what that we have, a little bit in paint for, for color, uh, to see that you actually can see the archaeological sites because they are not covered in this case by the canopy, because it's a very important tourist area, and so everybody goes there. Uh, but we know that there are more ecological sites around this, this place. Um, so now the preliminary findings, that the big, big question, like could we penetrate the canopy with a small lighter in the drone? Yes, we did. Uh, that's good. And other things that we were able to find some features. So like this, this is just a Hot that we did in the area, we are still processing the, the data, but you actually can see the difference here. Uh, this is a terrace that we could see in the, in the field. So, so we were able to penetrate that, that was very good. And uh, also very good in terms of, of, of information of how much we can do that now with the, with the drones that the, and the, and the LiDAR uh, systems for drones that you are available now. And that was very useful for the, the stakeholders there, specifically for the National Institute of Archaeology, because they are now in the process of, of trying to purchase some, some equipment. So they wanted to know this information to see which one, which equipment they could access and how they can use it. And we also developed, or, or this is not maybe not developed, but discover something that probably already other people discover. Uh, it was a workflow to how we can do the work there, basically. Uh, you need to prepare your your area first with a pre-flight and get the surface, the height of the canopy uh, first before flying, because the satellite imagery, even when it's really really accurate, uh, it suffers a lot from from deviations because the landscape is too rough and. And it really, really mess up with with the with the vertical height that you get from other kind of data. So it mess up in these cases that uh, it could be more ten to twenty meters uh, difference of what you get from other data collected from satellite imagery. And so you really need this first flight to collect where, how, how high are the are the trees? Also because information about the canopy is not also useful. You suppose we supposedly have in this area only trees that can grow to 20 meters tops, but we found trees that were 40 meters high. So we almost crashed the drone. Uh, we didn't uh, because of that. 
But so you'd really definitely need this because the other point that you can get this data, but only if you fly very close to, to the canopy. So if you fly very close to the canopy, 20 meters, 30 meters, or even 40 meters, you can penetrate this, even with uh, one of these very small drones. And if you do more flies, you get more cloud points, and it's a little bit more expensive, but you can do it. And then the thing is you have to process in a moment uh, the data from the canopy first before doing this, this process, and also battery charging. There was one of the limits there that we have there. We have like eight, like we have batteries for four flights per day, and the limit was that we couldn't charge the batteries very easy because the site where we were we were staying, it was like two hours from where we were collecting the data, and we didn't have energy. So we had to go back in the night, charge the batteries, and go on. So it was like more about planning. And also to uh, ask information for people to fly. And I will come back to later because this is a sensitive area in, in Colombia. So it's very important to, to be or to have that new workflow that is my, it might take a while uh, before somebody gives you permission uh, to fly the drone, even though that, that they, you are not flying from or either cross or in the field, but in another part, but you need to enter the, the, the area to fly. Uh, so work pro progress, we are now in an absolute key location for this data. We are working in DTN and DCM uh, data for the area and, and trying to identify activity areas of detection. That's also another like finding. We cannot get the precision that you have uh, about the structures or getting the structure specifically with this kind of drone, but you can get with this kind of drones what people got in the past uh, with the more powerful LiDAR uh, sensor. So we can get activity areas where we can go there and do another kind of, of research or be more intense uh, collection of data points with another kind of data set, for example, in terrestrial laser scan or something like that. Uh, so this is good for survey. That's kind of my, my, my the intake of this. And just to give you an idea, we collected the, actually, we were a couple of weeks there, uh, but in three days that when the workflow was st st started to flow, we collected around one or two square kilometers with this. So it's fairly, uh, fairly fast. Uh, and I think once you get it in the mood, or in the flow, you can get much, much more, more, more area collected uh, in, in more or less time. So, preliminary finders about the light, legacy LiDAR data. This is again Tejuna. This, are, this is an image of the features that you see also uh, without canopy, but some of them are below the canopy. You actually can see them very easily. So this is good because the theory, if we can see it with our own eyes, it's probably be able to detect them uh, automatically. That's good. Uh, but we also found that this data requires some, yeah, refined process or, uh, or especially in the location of the data set is not perfect. So we are working on that. Uh, it requires a little bit more processing. We found some of the regressions of, of the of the algorithm that has been applied to this data are very good to detect possible activity areas, but not good for as you said, for, for detecting the structure of, of, of you can, that what you can see here. So this is something that we know which ones we don't want to use now anymore and which ones we want to use, which is the working process right now. Uh, we are going to try to use an algorithm to work directly to the point cloud data. So, so far, most of the analysis has been uh, use, using the raster data set, um, but there are a couple of, of possibilities to work directly with a point house that seems to be, could be very efficient. There are also other uh, workflows or algorithms to work in the digital terrain model that we think it might be uh, giving us better results, and also they're faster than the other uh, the, the algorithms that are used it before, so we are going to, we are trying to throw in that, and also we are going to try deep learning uh, for the object detection, which is 
It's good. So we actually can do this because other people were doing this research before. I want to stress that, like doing legacy legacy analysis is because other people did it in the past, and we are able now to work again with this data set. So that's very important. And about the sadly imagery, uh, which is one of the parts that I'm more interested in, uh, we do find that this part that I talk about it is identifiable in the imagery in the 30 million resolutions. All these squares are places where one individual or one tree are in this area. This is the same archaeological site. So there is a spatial correlation with large archaeological sites, not all the archaeological sites, but large archaeological sites in this farm. That's very interesting in terms of social terms. We, we want to test this further. But we think that there might be uh, a relationship uh, between the size of archaeological sites and the, and, the, and the structure of the forest around, especially because they, since they were could be very useful trees, they might be using that to a specialization in the production or something else that we don't see in the archaeological record. In Colombia so far, you don't find things uh, that were organic, so like it's really hard, the uh, conservation the soil is very easy and, and, and the temperature is very high, but we assume sometimes that they didn't have a specialization in some regard because we don't find them in the archaeological record. So analyzing these kind of trees can give us a clue like things that we've done see in the archaeological record, but they might be there now, they could be a relationship uh, with other kinds of technology of production. So it's, we are just trying to expand the, the way that we see possibilities of, of what people were using in the past. And the working progress right now is that we are labeling these individuals of the three individuals in a much larger area that is 200 square kilometers and then try to do transfer learning and deep learning object detection with models that are already there or maybe uh, see if it works uh, and how far we can go in a very much larger area and see then try to look for new archaeological sites with these clusters of, of individuals. And this is a picture of how they look like. So it's, maybe it's not so good, but you see it like a star uh, here. So and they are tend to be in these kind of communities. They are not spread all, all over the landscape. Of, at least we haven't seen that. Maybe after the labeling, we'll see that they're hyper-dominant species. <laughs> and, and so all this will be not true, but that's also fine. Uh, but now that so far, they se seem to correlate in very, very close communities of individual trees. The question is like where all these communities correlate with archaeological sites or not. Uh, and the challenges of, of modern uh, uh, threats to heritage, uh, in the area, well, first we have this model of this urban expansion. Basically, it's a very nice place. People are uh, building uh, lodge uh, and things like that to for to eco tourism. But the problem is the places where they build is usually the places where archaeological sites are. Uh, so it's it's a problem. Uh, other big problem is the conflict and illegal army groups that are there. So the area where we are working is. The last five years where 800 fatalities per year is getting better, and uh, but it's, it's not most of the safe place in the world. Uh, so for being work, being able to work there, we have been working with the local communities and with the local universities that have been like building trust relationship with all the stakeholders in the area. So they know what we are doing. So we are not when we do the field work. It's not, it's not dangerous for us uh, because they know who we are so, and know what they were doing. So we're very explicit about it. Um, but for other people and, and for, for the people that live there, it's like very hard area to, to do things and, for example, try to protect archaeological sites. You also have illicit crops, illegal mining and drug trade routes in the region. So that makes hard uh, for the state to protect the sites there. So we have to be more uh, uh, smart about how we can document and protect the sites that they are there. And also there is another possible uh, new problem, 
is that there are small indigenous reserves in the area and they, be, they are planning to be expanded. That's not bad, that's good, but that will probably uh, result in land disputes between the indigenous population and the, all the non-indigenous population that are in the sites. And archaeological sites will play a pivotal role there because they can be used to land and start to dispute to, dis to, yeah, to help the, current, the, the indigenous population to show that this was part of their ancestral areas. And, and that's a problem that if this happened, it, I foresee that most of the people that are in the years will be starting to destroy archaeological sites just to erase any evidence that this could be part of the new reserves. So our approach in this case, uh, it's, it's try to partnership with the local authorities, like, like I said before, to enable the data-driven decision-making and how, how, what kind of things they can buy, uh, what, for what they need the equipment, for example, in this case, what they want to do that, and also see the conditions that you have there in the area at this moment. Um, other thing that we are doing is all the information that we are carrying. It's part of a large risk assessment of heritage and sacred site in the area. Uh, there are, it's, it's, a, it's a reserve area in, in a way. And we are sharing that or doing that actually for the indigenous communities, uh, for the local government uh, to be to give more information about how they relate with the landscape and archaeological sites, and they will be uh, their management plans for these areas. And, uh, also, we expect that this data will also support uh, la, any disputes that will come in the future uh, for ancestral disputes or, or where to the government has to aim to be by the new land for the reserves. So not necessarily creating a problem between communities that are not indigenous and indigenous communities, but give like a more informed decision of which one is better, uh, which land is better to buy, which one is not in this case, unlike informed people. Uh, future directions, uh, <coughs> of course, complete all the analysis that we have right in the early stage. We also want to do the ground routing of the sites once we have these activities areas. Uh, that could be probably next year, next summer. Uh, other part that we are also very interested in is working in the region that is close. Yeah, you cannot see it here, but it's this uh, high area that is 1,200, uh, yeah, 1,200, 12,000, uh, 12, around 12,000 square kilometers of LiDAR data. Uh, this is the mountain where we are working, and this is a wetland. Uh, but in this wetland, you have a lot of archaeological sites. It's rice fields in this case, and mounds and platforms that you can see there. Uh, so we are going to start trying to work also with this data uh, to improve information that we have from this area from the early 70s. So there are some maps about this, but they are not very accurate. Um, and they, of course, they don't look like uh, how the area looks like right now. So it's more 30, 40 years. Uh, so when they draw these maps, which are incredible, by the way, uh, it might be that the, the area was different just because it's very dynamic, like the cave. It's always flooding every single year. Uh, so we want to, to see how it looks like now, try to automatize looks for, for these archaeological sites, and also try to make an assessment of how far the the dynamics of the landscape itself have impacted the archaeological sites after 40 years. And uh, thanks a lot for listening. And this is all the people that are being involved. Uh, my recognized couple of faces there. Uh, yeah, thanks for being here.